watching Latino Talk TV. I'm your host, Jose Luis Jimenez. And I'm Ben Mendez. I'm Grant Compian. Tonight, we're going to actually uh, work very closely with a very wonderful organization here in town. If you haven't heard about it, it's called the Metropolitan Group. We're going to really get in depth to find out what's going on with the organization and what they focus on here in the community. So, but before we get into that, we're going to talk about what's going on in the community. Ben, what's going on out there? Well, in case you have been out of the news lately, uh, presidential candidate, Mr. Enrique Peña Nieto, won the presidency in Mexico. Mm. Now, keep in mind that he represents the old party, the old guard, if you will, mm -hmm. the PRI party. Now, the PRI party had lost with Fox and Calderon, but they're back now. Now, they were in, in presidency for 70 years prior to Fox and Calderon. Hmm. So they're back in power. Great. What's going on with that? Yeah, I tell you what, that they're, they, they ought to have an interesting spin as to, uh, they're saying that they're going to, you know, attack the, uh, you know, all the violence that's going on. So that's good. Well, I was, I was looking into that, you know, hopefully something good happens because in the last 12 years, the economy has really tanked down in Mexico. Some can blame the United States. Some say it's because of NAFTA. Others say it's because of CAFTA. But the truth is, all we really have to look at is, is hopefully the country regains a strong foothold and, and isn't so dependent on the United States and the way that the border towns are, are you know, developing right now. Well, the president's going to have a hard time. In the last six years, there's been 47,000 people dead because of the cartel, the, the war going on with the cartel. And he's a young so, man. He's like 45. The president, the, the incoming president is 45 years old. He's a former governor. Mm. So he has a little bit of experience in dealing with the cartels. But I tell you what, uh, he has his hands full with the cartel right now. I think that the economic impact that Mexico plays on the, on the, on the worldwide level with petroleum mm -hmm. is huge. I think they're the seventh biggest producer, producer of, uh, of, of uh, petroleum uh, in the world. So they, they have a huge impact. Well, all I hope is that something good comes out of this, and uh, hopefully the country can, can regain its footing and you know develop a good economy down there. Well, the other item that came out of the news just recently was the Gallup poll. Uh, they did an, a pretty much a poll with the Hispanic voters, mm -hmm. and they found that 52% of Hispanics lean Democrat, 23 lean Republican, mm -hmm. and the remainder, re uh, they lean independent. Now, when they were asked <laughs> who were they going to vote for, 67% of all Hispanic voters said that they were going to support Obama. Hmm. And 26% for Mitt Romney, and the remainder were undecided. So it's going to be interesting how the Hispanics sway either way. Uh, as you all know, that the majority of Hispanics are Democrat, so the majority of them are going to be with Obama. Mm -hmm. So the immigration policy, the Obamacare, all of that's going to take into effect. I mean, we're going to have some major issues uh, to vote for, mm -hmm. and also not related to the presidential race. So hopefully the Hispanics come out to vote. Uh, we need them to come out and vote so that they can have a, so that we can make an impact, if you will, nationally. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest thing is that people got to understand what's at stake and, and, and start build on that foundation and, and uh, uh, take a part of the government and uh, have a voice. But every vote counts, and that's the biggest thing that people got to understand. Yeah, I agree completely, and we've got some more current events. Well, last show we, we talked to TMO, and we talked about engaging folks uh, into the political process. Uh, and I, I think that's a great thing that uh, TMO is doing some things in the community, getting yep. them engaged. You know, the biggest thing about tonight's show is to find out what, a, what organizations do and how they're trying to help the community, because there's a lot of misinformation out there. And hopefully, you know, with, the, with this avenue of having the show, we want to just openly educate and give people the opportunity to connect one-on-one -on -one so they can call in and actually talk to people directly. Because a lot of times people just don't understand what an organization really does to help people. And, you know, I'm really excited about doing this, don't you? Yeah, I tell you that we're very fortunate to have such a strong panel here tonight, good, informative people. So I think that we're going to have a great show. Yeah, and I wish the cameras could pan out and see the guests. I think this is our largest, largest live studio audience we've had yet. So. <laughs> hi, hi, Mom. Hello. Hi, hey. <laughs> <laughs> and, and on that note, we're going to take a quick break, people. If you go all right with that, uh, our producer, John T., is going to take us a quick break. We'll be right back, okay? 
Welcome back. You're watching Latino Talk TV, and welcome to the beauty of live television. Okay, we got with us the Metropolitan Organization, and we have three guests with us. First is uh, Franklin Olson, the Executive Committee with TMO. Yes. Welcome. Uh, we have uh, Reverend Kevin Collins, co-chair of TMO. Thank you. Welcome yes. to the show. And Reverend Miguel Solorzano. 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 I didn't Thank see you. the accent here, sorry. But so, pastor at St. Charles uh, Borromeo Church off of Tidwell and uh, Bowman? Uh, yes. See? yes. I, I know my north side. <laughs> 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 so, welcome. So, just to start off, what is the TMO? TMO is, is an organization of churches and other institutions. Um, we have uh, churches join the Metropolitan Organization, and uh, then we work with the people of those various churches to develop leaders and uh, to, to, to actually to, to have a voice in places where they might not have a voice. And so we start off on the local level. We always start off with, uh, with you know, just talking to people one-to-one -one, or we get together in a little group and we start to ask them what, what are pressures affecting your family? What's, mm. what's going on? And uh, what's, what's keeping your family from thriving? And then we, we, we ask the next question we ask them is, what do you want to do about it? <laughs> and so then, then what we do is we go about educating them how to take charge of these, these different issues and to have a voice at the table when sometimes they felt like they didn't have a voice. Father, what are some of the issues that you all are currently <clears throat> taking on? Um, we've taken on the, uh, the immigration issue. As, as uh, Father Miguel will say, we have a, a meeting. When is it? Tonight, there is a meeting tonight uh, at Christ the King Church, and everyone is, is welcome to go. It's uh, mostly, is it in Spanish? Yeah. I, I guess the, the meeting is in Spanish, mm -hmm. and it's to inform people, especially now about the DREAM Act and how it's going to be implemented. We have a problem now in the community that there are many, many uh, people who want to use this opportunity of the DREAM Act to take advantage of people. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, as a lawyer, an attorney told me the other day that he had a few cases already, People going to see him because they have already did a mistake by uh, filing an application that there is not even, uh, right now it's not officially uh, the way it's going to be handled. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is an information meeting tonight, 7 p.m., Christ the King on Main Street and near 45 North. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's one of our big issues. The other issues, we've, we've been involved in education. Yes. Uh, for many, many years, we uh, got the city to uh, put money aside for the uh, after-school achievement program. We've been involved in health care issues in our, in our, in our neighborhoods. So Obamacare? Uh, no, not necessarily. No? This, this is, goes, our, our issues are, are local issues. Okay, okay. That's, a, that's kind of a national issue. But we, we uh, for instance, uh, uh, well, I could give you some couple. Of, we, we asked the, and we actually lobbied, I would say, advocated at the, at the Houston Hospital District, and you were part of that, Franklin, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to set up a special clinic for indigent people who needed uh, uh, dialysis mm -hmm. because there wasn't anything to take care of indigent people they were being taken care of at the emergency room. We've also worked with the hospital district to, uh, to, to lower the fees for parking for people that go there and to make the, the, the gold card easier to, to fill out the application. Uh, other, other things with health care too, but mainly affecting our, what, what we, we talk to our families and say, what's, what's going on? And then uh, uh, the other one that we've really, really put a big investment in is workforce development. Mm -hmm. And we've got, a, we've, got, we're, we've got a program that we are sponsoring. We're sponsoring the program, and the program called Capital Idea Houston is sponsoring right now 120 students to go to community college and get a, a, a certificate and degree in an area where they will get a job when they finish. Mr. Franklin, give us a little bit of the history of TMO, and, and you're with the Methodist Church, is that correct? Yeah, I, uh, have, I'm a member of Memorial Drive United Methodist Church, which is a west side, primarily Anglo uh, community, and uh, we have been involved with TMO for over 13 years now, and for me personally, it was a, a, a real blessing and a prayer come true, because you know, we live in the most diverse city in the United States, and yet we have all of these barriers that have been built up over time. I don't trust you. My politics are not like yours, uh, you know. And, and, and so I felt that this was an opportunity for our congregation to be involved in issues around justice, but also uh, of, of learning more about our neighbor. You know, Father Collins uh, was talking a bit about uh, the dialysis clinic. 
And the issues that we take on just don't fall out of the air. <coughs> this came out of a very poignant story from a, from a woman whose brother had died because he could not get adequate treatment at the hospital district for this. Mm. And so we began to study the issue and were able to bring about a, uh, uh, a change in the way the hospital district treated people who had uh, a need for dialysis. So as I say, it just doesn't come out of the air and we're all sitting around and saying, what do you think we ought to do? Right. You know, <laughs> because these are real stories. We start with people's stories and we're able to share those with one another and then come up with issues that we feel are very important. Mm -hmm. And one important thing is to mix different religions like the Methodists, the Catholics. We had a meeting in an African-American Baptist church and we discussed the issues that affect the African-American community, the Hispanic community, and we are all involved in, in these uh, different issues like wages, uh, immigration, or any other social concerns locally. You know, and TMO is one of the most unique organizations in Houston because even though many organizations do acts of mercy, you know, collecting of food and clothing, we don't do that. And some people say, well, why don't you do that? Because we feel that where we can do the best work is in our neighborhoods to help people decide what kind of issues they want to address, such as uh, health care, but also about police protection. You know, uh, it's been about 10 years ago when I worked in a community in Spring Branch that was primarily immigrant, and they had a cantina. And every Friday and Saturday night, there were gunshots in the community, and moms would put their kids in the bathtubs to keep them from getting shot and killed. There were children who were run over by drunks in, mm -hmm. in that community. And those people worked together and were able to shut down that cantina. Now that's the kind of work that TMO can do where we organize people into effective uh, witnessing and, and effective ways of getting things done. Well, what do y'all think of the new city ordinance about uh, feeding the homeless? Well, again, see, the thing is, we, well, we, when we develop an opinion or something about it, it mm -hmm. comes from, from the organization, from the, the grassroots. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we really haven't, we haven't taken an opinion about that. So mm -hmm. we, we, we uh, uh, so all of our, all of our, whenever we take a position, mm -hmm. it's something we've studied, we've researched, we've, we've heard it from our families. So like, <coughs> I, I've got a lot of opinions about a lot of things, but, but I'm not, but, I, but that's, that doesn't have, that's not necessarily what TMO mm -hmm. is about. So, so we, we, it has to come because it can't be just what we want to do. It's got to mm -hmm. be, because we, if they're not involved in it, then, then it's not going to be powerful. So we have to have the people that are that are empowered to do that. And so that's that's kind of my answer to that one. But but we have uh, uh, the one that the the the, uh, the workforce development came. We also, by the way, belong to a series, a network of organizations like us throughout Texas. We don't just stand alone in Texas. We have an organization in San Antonio and Austin, Dallas, Fort Worth, about ten or twelve organizations throughout Texas. And so when, when it comes to an issue about Texas, where we find out that we can support each other, we will support each other in that. So uh, for instance, the one uh, uh, that came up several years ago was, I don't know if you remember, but in 2003, they pretty much made the children's health insurance program very difficult. They pretty much shut it down mm -hmm. uh, in, in the state. And it was, it's, it was a health that was, a lot of our families, we'd signed them up. And they were all very, you know, got their kids getting health care, stuff like that. And so we, we, with our other organizations throughout Texas, we went to Austin, we sat down with the lieutenant governor, and because and, and, he had, it had stalled in the Senate, the, the re, bring it back, and we got him to get it going again in the Senate. And so now, you know, our families got the Children's Health Care Insurance Program back. Hmm. And so, uh, so but we, we went there with about a thousand petitions from each organization, you know, petitions from our churches here, petitions from churches in the Valley, Austin, San Antonio, and so that's when that's when we when we bring all that voice to the table. That's that's where we we feel we can be effective. So if there is any pastor watching us right now, 
<laughs> Please call TMO to join the TMO. Okay. You know, so we well, they one. can call the, the the number. There's a number on the screen right now. It's two eight one eight four six five zero seven nine. If you want to chime in or ask any direct questions, any denomination, uh, any denomination, any group can join. You want churches? The churches join, correct? Right. Yeah. yeah. People, we we belong as organizations. So so churches. We have we have a synagogue. We have Methodist churches. We have Baptist churches. We have African American churches. We have Catholic churches. All these churches all make up. The metropolitan, and so it, it. Sometimes we have to kind of like get to a consensus about things that that some issues that really you know the one church may be really strong about you know the other churches may not. So we we have to we can't take a position on that because we don't have a consensus. And it seems that in in, in September we might get a lead organizer that is Muslim. Uh, it seems uh, I'm not sure, but maybe. So mm -hmm. so we want to be also different ethnic groups, not only like Hispanics or African Americans or white, but different, yeah. I mean, different yeah. ethnic groups so, as well. So what do you say to those that say that, you know, there's more, there's more separation and discrimination within the churches, that's why we can't work together. Really, what Come you're to saying, one of our meetings. <laughs> yes. Because Come what you're to one showing of our is meetings. that it, it is possible because oh, when yes. you look at mass media, this is not covered. I mean, they don't mm -hmm. usually show a Methodist and a Catholic and a synagogue. I mean, that's not what's well, covered. Well, I, I think I shared with you the last time <clears throat> I was here about about the immigration issue and how the cardinal. We were we were talking to the cardinal about it because the church, Catholic Church, has taken a position on on immigration reform, mm -hmm. and uh, and we were talking to the cardinal. And he said, "Sure, but 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 we need all the churches involved." So he sent us on a mission to go talk to to your bishop and the bishop of the Lutheran Church and the bishop of the Episcopalian Church, the head presbyter. And that was about two or three years ago. And since then, those, all those had, they've never done this before. But it was kind of something that came out of one of the things we were talking about. They meet out of, on a regular basis now, about on a quarterly basis, to talk about what can be done about reforming uh, immigration and where they can all have uh, synergy on it. And I must say, that was uh, a real sticking point in our congregation, uh, that the Methodist bishop would take a position on that. And, but... And, and so there was a lot of consternation with some of our congregation. But the thing that came out of that was a conversation about what justice is mm -hmm. and the importance of justice in our ministry. Because a lot of people didn't understand what justice was all about. And so I think it was a growth. Uh, it, it created a lot of growth for us. And, and, and I'm so thankful again for th that opportunity and that we had a pastor who was willing to push forward on on that issue okay. well we have a caller on the line and we're going to bring her on the line okay judy you're live on the air do you have a question hi thank you for taking my call um i do, do have a question for the priest on the show today and i'm just trying to figure out how is it that a church can go about um getting tmo at their parish that's a great Wait, what question. What are the procedures <laughs> yeah. that we need to follow? Well, you have to get your pastor on board. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the, the that's thing. the one because because to be belong to TMO, you we ask the, the all of our churches to pay dues, and usually the, the pastor is the final word when it comes to paying dues. <laughs> so so uh, if you you uh, you can we have a website. I hopefully they'll, they'll put it up there on mm -hmm. on the uh, uh, and, a, and a phone number, and hopefully they'll put it up there, and you can uh, talk to your pastor. And uh, is it a Catholic church? It is. It okay. Is. Now, uh, the second part of the question is, uh, is what if the community itself wants the, the TMO there, but the pastor is adamant that, no, he doesn't want anything like that? Is there other steps we can take? Um, I don't, well, what, uh, that's, a, that's another good question. He's trying to walk the I know ground. that. I, I'll tell you what happened with one Episcopal church, and it didn't last very long. One Episcopal church, they couldn't get their pastor on board. And they formed their own little separate organization, and uh, and they 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 gathered up their little dues, and they belong they belonged as a separate organization, kind of associated with their church. Now, it, unfortunately, they didn't last very long. It really takes uh, a, a pastor. And if you want if you want uh, me to talk to to your pastor, I'll be happy to go talk to him and, and tell him about it and see if he, we can convince him to join. Awesome. Thanks okay. for calling, Judy. That sounds good. Thanks. Thank buddy. you. Thank you. Bye bye. I'll tell you what. Uh, I'm intrigued that there's so many different types of churches in, involved in your organization. Mm -hmm. What percentage of TMO would you say is Catholic? Ah, uh, what percentage? Of TMO. Of TMO. 60%. Uh, 60, you think 60%? Maybe. 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 Yeah. I, I don't know, maybe 50%. Yeah, but not, not all the parishes in Houston belong to TMO. Right. Yeah. Right. Only a few parishes. Well, I'm just belong. talking about your membership. Yeah. yeah. Only a few. About 50%. Uh, 
So like she has a very good question, and even even the cardinal said that those pastors who would like to to know if the cardinal approves the organization to give him a call, you know, so so that he he has he supports Timo. Hoy Father Miguel para los que hablan español, dale sí. información de la. Sí, de... hoy en la noche, hoy en la noche tenemos a las siete de la noche una reunión en la iglesia de Cristo Rey sobre migración. Hay mucha información ahora sobre migración. Hay gente que se quiere aprovechar engañando, diciendo que que el Dream Act uh, ya hay ahorita regulación sobre el Dream Act. Mm -hmm. Sí hay, sí se aprobó, pero pero hay muchas todavía no está todavía la forma como se va a aplicar. Entonces hoy a las siete de la noche en la iglesia de Cristo Rey que está en la calle Main, cerquita del Freeway 45, para una reunión a las 7 de la noche abierta a todo público para que vayan a esta reunión. Así que ojalá que Gracias, que Padre. I'd like, to, I'd like to bring up another thing that was very recent that people maybe can relate to. Um, you know, recently uh, the, uh, the, we have the rebuilt Houston uh, uh, referendum that passed. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you remember or not, when, the, uh, when it passed, uh, the mayor was very adamant that there would be no exceptions. Everybody would have to pay their part. And uh, so uh, the churches were up in arms, and, and so, but, but that was not our concern. Our concern was, although we we're all churches, we, our concern was the people in the churches. And so we know from our conversations that even though somebody might have a little small lot, and, but they're maybe on a fixed income, and they, in, in any little increase in their, in their, their costs are going to be affecting them. So, so we talked to the mayor about, about three or four times, and we, we said, you know, mayor, Something has to be done, and so after uh, after the, maybe the third time, mm -hmm. she she said, "Okay, we're going to set aside a fund of five hundred thousand dollars for people to apply to mm -hmm. if they can't afford this." And so, but nobody else in town was doing that part of it. Mm -hmm. So that's one of that's the way we kind of and so. Uh, but we we have we have a, a regular meeting with the like with politicians and city council members and the mayor to kind of like just say tell them about what's going on that they might be missing in 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 their. Uh, in, in, when they're running their campaign or when they're running something. Let me, so what's, let me start over. What's the phone number that you want someone to call to contact Timo? Uh, I think it's the phone number under my name. It, it's it's uh, uh, 713807, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> I gave it to your producer. <laughs> so, uh, let me, uh, Father Kevin mentioned about talking to is. politicians. Now, let me assure you, we don't support any politician or any political party. We're nonpartisan. And sometimes that gets a little tricky because a lot of politicians want you to support them. Mm -hmm. In fact, we've had politicians who uh, were invited to one of our events, and they said, "Well, I don't know why I need to go to your event. You're not going to, you're not going to endorse me, and you're not going to give me any money. So why should I come?" <laughs> <to do that?" laughs> well, yeah, yeah exactly. The truth comes out. Well, that's, that's what we have to but we, we, we now if that's that's something that, that we haven't had one in, in a while. But when when the last mayoral camp, uh, campaign was going on, we do what we call an accountability session. Okay, usually when you meet with a politician, they come and you know and they make promises to you about what they're going to do for you. Hmm. All right, usually and so and so. But we when we when they come and talk to us, we get them to, to say you know this is what we're what this is what we want you to do for us, not what you think you can do for us, but what we want you to do for us. I think that's a great uh, segue into taking a break and then taking, coming back in the second half and talking exactly about that, about sure. what's going on with politics, also with the immigration situation, why TMO is doing an event like today, you know, because the fact is people are taking advantage. Mm. People are abusing the other people that are out there. So with that note, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Mm. You're watching Latino Talk TV. And you're back. You're watching Latino Talk TV, and we are here with the TMO. I think I said V twice. <laughs> the Metropolitan Organization. Thank you. So uh, we still, we're still with Father Collins, also Franklin Olson. And now we have, joining us is Ms. Christina Serna from Immaculate Conception Church. Welcome. Thank you. So right before the break, you were talking about the political situation that's out there and how politicians at times don't want, may not want to come around because they don't get anything out of it. Mm -hmm. So how does a group like TMO uh, help persuade positively to okay. get some action? <laughs> well, we're about relationships. Okay. That is the basis of our organization, is to build relationships. And we believe that if you keep hounding people long enough, you know, they'll, they'll meet with you. And hopefully, at that point, they will begin to listen to you if they're smart, you know, because we are voters, and that they will respond. They don't always respond in positive ways, 
But if we're if if uh, we respect them and they respect us and they listen to us, that's all we can really ask for hmm. at the bottom line. But hopefully they'll see our position and be willing to help support us in some way. So no early voting cards and no campaign contributions? No. No. <laughs> that was being sarcastic. No. <laughs> no. Okay, you asked about our phone number a while back, so let me go ahead and give that out while I get a chance. Uh, 713-807-1429. Is our is our phone number seven one three eight zero seven one four two nine? Ms. Edna, you're in the heart of the Hispanic community in the East End. Yes, sir. Uh, tell us about some of the issues that are affecting the people that attend your church. Okay, I'll talk about uh, as a mother. Okay. I'll be part of the TMO in the '90s when my kids went to the elementary school. So as all the mothers, uh, especially Latino mothers, I'm worried about the education. So in TMO, I learned how can I be a, a good leader, not only in the community, but in my family. Mm -hmm. So I start um, uh, participating in the meetings. So I learned that uh, if everybody can uh, have uh, something uh, better in this country, uh, I learned that uh, talk with the representatives in the city and in the state, because uh, with TMO, we have uh, trips to Austin and talk uh, with the representatives. And most of the it's, it's, it's something uh, beautiful for me because uh, my kids receive a good education and uh, through the city we receive grants for the uh, after school programs. That's what I'm, I'm always have a, a good uh, uh, position with TMO and especially with our priest. Here, Father Kevin, because uh, in the church, we don't have received only the support as uh, members of the church, but as a community. So it's, it's the, with, with the TMO, of course, it's the leadership of different church, church organizations, but also volunteers. So talk to us about how people can volunteer, like Mrs. Seta and I yes. here. Oh, yeah, we're only as strong as our leaders. Well... One of the things that we do in our congregations is from time to time, well, there are several ways. First of all, we have what are called uh, individual meetings. And those of us who are active in our congregation and work with TMO will we'll meet with the leaders or people that we think are interesting and say, how did you come by your faith? What are your concerns about the community, et cetera? And that way we begin to build relationships with them. The second thing is, is that we begin, we have what are called house meetings. And these are small meetings of, let's say, eight to ten people. And again, we'll pr propose a question. What are the, the uh, pressures on you and your family? And we'll listen. We want a story. We don't want you being up here in your head and talking about Obamacare and all of that. We want to know what's going on in your life right now about your kids, your worries, and so forth. And so out of that, we, we find people who have passion and anger around certain issues, and we feel like maybe have a, a following of three or four people in their community or their, uh, their Sunday school who are interested in the same thing they are. And that's the way we began to build the organization is with these kinds of, of small meetings. So it's fair to say that some of the people on the west side of Houston uh, uh, would have some of the same issues Absolutely. as the people on the east side of Houston yes. or north side of Houston or what have you. And it's in, important for them to hear those concerns also because we get sound bites. We don't hear stories, you know, and we don't see uh, real people, you know, and we don't really see issues that people have. And so it's important for our people to be able to hear those stories, too. One of the stories that actually wasn't one of our stories, but it came out of San Antonio, happened when a, when a Levi's plant closed down and shipped a thousand jobs out, just like that. A thousand people lost their jobs. And uh, we, uh, we started talking, having these meetings 
with, and these people were parishioners of a lot of our organization there in San Antonio. And so we started discovering that for them to go get another kind of job, they didn't have the skills to do it. They, it wasn't because they, they, they'd maybe not finished high school or they'd finished high school and not gone on to what the schooling that was needed for, for another job. And so uh, we also discovered that there were several different areas of the workforce that needed employees, skilled employees. And so things kind of came together in synergy and we put together a program that, that got these people back into school and we, we, we got the government to give, give money, we got businesses to give money and put this program together. And so, so what they do is we find the jobs where they need workers hmm. that pay well, that have, that have health care benefits. And we say, okay, we can get you trained for that job and overcome any obstacles that might come your way because it's, it's difficult for somebody who's like in their late 20s, early 30s to go back to school mm -hmm. and, and, and just, just try it sometime, you know. And so, mm -hmm. so they went back and, and so we get them back, we get them through the schooling at the community college and now, they, now a lot of them are, are, get these jobs and they have a career path. I talked to someone who went through a, this and now they're making $35 an hour. Hmm. And, and, in, and in Houston, yeah. we took this model about two years ago after laying a lot of groundwork for two or three years, and we've established Capital Idea Houston here. And we have about 100 students who are involved in community colleges. They get full uh, grants and, uh, and, and scholarships to go through the program. This is one of the most successful programs that HCC and Lone Star have in terms of people graduating because we know that, that people who are involved in community college, that a very low percentage of them ever graduate from the two-year college. So what about the candidates that are out there that say you should only get the education you can afford? Why should anybody go above and beyond and give somebody else that extra helping hand? Because because education is the only way you can move from one uh, area of life into a more productive area of life. You can't keep people down on the bottom rung. But if they can't afford it, well, well I think that's that's short sighted. I think yeah, I think absolutely. I think many businesses would say, you know, where are the skilled workers? that we need, okay? So, so many businesses have to, when they, sometimes they have to put people back into training, mm -hmm. you know, to get them, to get them the education. So that the jobs nowadays are, are technical jobs. Uh, some of the jobs that we're, we're training for people are, 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 are process operators. I've learned about all these different jobs <laughs> that logistics that I didn't, didn't even know existed where you need two years of community college. Mm -hmm. And so, and so, it, and these are the people <clears throat> that once they get the job, that, that they're, they're buying a house, paying property mm -hmm. taxes, they're buying insurance from State Farm, <clears throat> they're, they're, uh, they're, uh, they're, uh, they're oh, out there, they're, 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 paying, <laughs> they're paying taxes, they're, you know, they, they, are, they are starting to contribute. We, we, over the lifetime of our graduates from, from this program, over their lifetime, they give back 500% of what is invested in them. Outstanding. And because, because they get off of, of WIC, and, and, and SNAP and different things, which, which is draining resources. Mm -hmm. And then they start to make money and start to put money back in. Through, through, through. Just know that I personally, yes. I'm a product of military service and mm -hmm. I earned my education, okay? So mm -hmm. uh, the reason I ask you that is because it became a very hot topic on my Facebook page. I, I throw things out there just to get people's reaction to see what's going on. But there are a lot of people out there that truly believe that if you can't afford it today, you can't pay for it, you shouldn't get it. And I personally think that's the craziest thing I've ever heard in my life. Mm -hmm. How you know? can the business community help TMO? Is that is there some type of? A... I'm glad you asked that. We have we, <laughs> we just happen to have a, a we we, are, we put right together the, the a, a resource guide that we publish and we sell ads for that resource guide. And so the business community can buy ads in our resource guide. We've asked some businesses to just donate directly mm -hmm. to TMO. Uh, those those are the two main ways that they can. And uh, so that's. They can, they can also be supportive of Capital Idea uh, because Capital Idea is one of, the, uh, uh, one of the ways that employers can get qualified uh, employees that will stay with you, that are committed, and uh, will make, make them money. The other issue, and, and we know that uh, at least uh, 
the uh, Greater Houston Partnership and uh, others in other business people in Houston are very concerned about the issues around immigration, mm -hmm. about immigration reform. And uh, obviously, we uh, are concerned about immigration reform also. And so being able to connect with them and, and, and our interest, I think, can, can be very helpful. The last thing is, if they are a large business organization, uh, that they need employees. And uh, they can help in terms of determining what kind of, of employees they need and for what skills. And then they can help pay for that education that, mm -hmm. that we're talking about. So there are a lot of ways that the business, we want to work with the business community. We're, we're very pro-business. Awesome. I think the proof is in the pudding with Mrs. Uh, Satana here being a recipient, her kids being a recipient, and now providing her services and volunteering. That's very nice of you. Yes, it. it's very important, especially as a parent, we need to support our uh, kids, especially with the DREAM Act. It's a very good way to, to involve all the family, not only the young people. Mm -hmm. The future is for them, but we as the parents, we need to work uh, together with them. Outstanding. I want to thank you for being on the show, uh, on this segment of the show, excuse me. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, but we're going to lead into <coughs> the actual issue of employees, health care, and actually the Affordable Care Act and what's really going on with that, okay? You're watching Latino Talk TV. We'll be right back. Uh, you're watching Latino Talk TV. Now we have uh, Beto Cardenas, an attorney. Uh, I'd say the long name, but you're a counsel. Uh, and also Reverend Kevin Collins once again. So what I want to get into this segment is uh, the Affordable Care Act and what it really means uh, to the community about what the Supreme Court actually decided on. What, what does it really mean? Well, the Supreme Court had three issues before it. Number one was whether the act was constitutional via the Commerce Clause. They said it was not. Then they looked at the Tax and Spend Clause, that Congress has the power to tax and spend, and they said that therein, the individual mandate that you have to have health insurance or pay a tax, that was constitutional. The third part was Medicaid funding from the, for the states and whether the states could reject uh, part of the program and keep their base funding. The court said they could, uh, do that. So now, what does it mean for the community? It means the state of Texas has to determine, at least for people that are 133 percent within the poverty line, whether the state will expand their services so that they can gain expanded Medicaid services. Hmm. For the rest of us, it means that if our employer doesn't provide health insurance, um, there will be actions that the government can take to ensure that you are uh, purchasing health insurance. So what you're saying is that every businessman or woman has to pay for insurance for their employees. That That is a part of, of uh, uh, yes, there is a correction okay. there. So for instance, if I'm a laborer and I'm working, let's say two months out of the year, does the business owner still have to provide insurance for me? I believe that there are certain protocols in terms of the number of hours you need to work in order to be considered a full-time employee and the number of employees an employer has to have in order to meet those specifications. Beth, as far as this uh, actual uh, ruling, when does it take effect and to let the viewers know that? Well, the ruling actually lets the law go into effect. There was a injunction, if you will, as to whether the law could go into effect immediately for certain provisions. Most of the provisions, Greg, don't go in until 2014, and so that's when you're going to start seeing some of the changes go forward. Can it be reversed? It can be reversed if Congress does one of two things. Number one, repeals it just outright, or two, starts getting into an argument uh, among political parties and the president, whoever that may be in the next term, over funding uh, the mechanisms of the legislation. So what are you saying is this, this Affordable Care Act doesn't have any funding yet? Well, it does have funding, but what you're looking at is all sorts of elements to be able to fund, one, the Medicaid expansion uh, via the federal government and then a match to the states. Number two, you're also going to look at funding the federal officials that are going to be necessary either at the IRS to deal with the tax issues or at Health and Human Services to deal with the implementation. You know, one thing that we forgot to mention is that uh, Beto is the chairperson 
for the housing for the Harris County Housing Authority. Is that correct? That is correct. And and you recently took over as chair about a year ago. Uh, about uh, hundred days ago. Hundred days ago. Okay. Well, <laughs> congratulations. <every> day. <laughs> uh, congratulations to you. Thank you. I know that you are going to do a great job. Everything you touch seems to turn into gold. So congratulations. Not, that, not yet. Wait. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, don't but, touch my watch. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I'm just curious. I, I know you all don't focus on national issues, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, this is really a, somewhat of a local issue. Uh, what is the TMO going to do uh, regarding this issue? Well. It, we, it's, it's, it's a statewide issue. I think, it, like he mentioned, it's a, it, it depends on whether the governor, I believe, I don't know if the legislature or the governor accepts the Medicaid uh, package part it'll, of it. It'll be a combination. It'll be a combination. Well, you, you could probably, we could probably, it's, it's, we haven't talked about it yet, but I can pretty much say that in January that all of our organizations, not TMO, but our organization in Austin, organization in, in Dallas, uh, San Antonio, we're going to be there at the legislature telling our legislators, we want this package. We don't want them to reject it. I don't know if this is true or not, but I heard that the governor was going to reject all the funds from the federal government. So if the governor rejects the funds, does that mean that we are not going to have Obamacare here in Texas? Well, I'm not sure what the final decision will be as to whether the state expands Medicaid service to that 133% above the poverty line uh, number. If it does, then... We don't know what, you know, or it does, well, we don't have that discussion. If it doesn't, then you have to look at all of the business provisions with individuals that have employees, employers that have employees, those go into effect. So that expansion provision, that's one that the state needs to make a determination on. Everything else, that's still in place. So, so go ahead. I'm no, sorry, go ahead. Go, go, go ahead. Well, I, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in here. I believe there's also a provision uh, uh, that, that if you're a small business person, like if you have 50 or less employees, right. and you get a, uh, you can uh, get a discount on your, on your medical care, you can apply for some kind of rebate or something like that. Is that correct? Uh, You've got me on that one. Yeah. I'm sure there's well, a provision yeah, somewhere yeah. in there. That... I was reading up on this, and then it is true that so for now, mm -hmm. because there, it hasn't become a reality just yet, but if you have... 50 or less employees, you're not required to carry the health insurance. 50 plus and above, 51 and above, you have to carry it or pay a fine. Mm -hmm. And I've read in certain cases that there's some business owners just seriously considering just accepting the fine rather than actually pay for the health insurance. Mm -hmm. You know, so, but what I want to get down to is, is really, there's a lot of people saying now that this is socialized health care, that we shouldn't do this, we shouldn't help our fellow man, you know, on a personal level, do you think this is actually a good idea or not? On a personal <clears> level, <throat> I, I think we already have socialized health care. It's just run a little bit, it's just run very inefficiently because if somebody gets sick, they go to the hospital district, to the emergency room, and we all pay for it. So that's socialized health care. And so, you know, it's going to be, how, how, do you, how do you have socialized health care that is more efficient and also more people and more effective? Because people will, there'll be, there's a preventative aspect to this, I understand. And people, people going to the emergency room, as we learned with the dialysis clinic that we talked about, is very expensive. And so, and so people going to the local clinics, to the local doctors, is a much better way to treat people who are sick than to have them show up in, show up in the emergency room for a cold or flu or something like that. So, so we've already got socialized health care. Whoever says this is socialized health care really doesn't understand the way it works. Uh, you know, diseases don't go target one class of individuals over another, and therein lies the situation that everybody has to face. Everyone's going to get sick at some point. Everybody's going to die at some point, uh, to be frank. But what you have to look at is how you balance out that access to care, and it should not be a discriminatory effect based on someone's economic status. Hmm. Well, what is it? Just why do the politics have such an overbearing factor? Is it just the the heat of the political arena right now? What is it? I think there is a a tension, if you will, that has polarized this country, and that's based on the fact that political parties are at the extremes and that there isn't a moderate middle um, on either side. Uh, it's very limited in that regard. You don't find moderate Republicans. You don't find conservative Democrats. Part of that is based on redistricting. Hmm. We're going to put the phone number on the, on the screen if you, in case you want to chime in on this because... Uh, there's a lot of people that are very polarized on this topic. I mean, it's like some people are just so adamantly against 
you know, providing this type of health care you know, protection, some would call it, they, they just hate the idea that we were going to take care of somebody else. But what you're telling me is it's, it already happens, right? Sure. They're already paying for it. Mm -hmm. we're, paying, we're paying big bucks to the way we're doing it now, and it's very in, in, inefficient and ineffective. Well, you know, as a business owner, uh, I think it's important that <clears throat> the insurance industry, if you will, uh, make some changes because we have some people that have pre-existing conditions that cannot get insurance. Mm -hmm. And until we solve that problem, we're, we're going to have some issues with the insurance all over the place and nationally. Mm -hmm. uh, we really need to nip it at the bud, which is at the federal level, and have some of those regulations and policies come down, mm -hmm. down the pike if, to the state of Texas and down um, to the county and so forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, do, you see a lot of other countries, uh, the Bahamas, for example, and they have a, a they, they pay fun, and if they, everyone is insured through the government or what have you. And I know that's in uh, several other countries. So what are the pros, what are the cons about that? Oh, you're uh, making me want to go on a vacation when you said that. <laughs> <Bahamas. laughs> well, here's here's a central uh, question that people disagree over, which is what is the fundamental role of the government? Is the role of the government to be in the health care insurance business, or is it to regulate? Is it to create opportunity? Is it to constrict it? And I think the central focus um, that you will find individuals agree or disagree on is, should you pull your resources together if you're a business owner with other similar business owners, or should the government step in and run the program? That's why you have a little bit of disagreement um, on this subject. So what are the pros, what are the cons? I think there is obviously an advantage to having more people insured because costs come down. We see that just across the board. What is the negative? Some might argue that there are some personal liberties that are breached. There are individuals who may not want the government telling them what to do or what to pay money for. As the Supreme Court has ruled, Congress can force you to pay a tax or a penalty, um, and they can obviously create laws that enforce out those actions. So is this a good thing or a bad thing? I think we're going to have to wait and see um, the effects of what ends up happening and transpiring when the law goes into effect. If mm -hmm. you see that more people are covered and costs come down, then I think one can argue that it is a good thing. If you don't see that in people's pocketbooks, there may be some frustration. and Individuals might say, you know what, not so much. Hmm. Well, if you look at it, we already have Texas-wide uh, workers' compensation coverage for business owners. Uh, there are state plans and there are also private plans. So we protect for, you know, accidents and issues like that inside the workplace. Wouldn't this just be expanding that coverage to the, to the private, you know, to the individual, to the personal level? You know, the sad situation with that is that there are some instances where not for everybody. We were talking about immigration earlier. If you are a uh, self-employed individual um, and those taxes don't actually cover you, then workman's comp does not exist. It's actually one of the flaws within the health care system and Obamacare. If we look at the state of Texas, where we have actually close to a million or so more workers uh, that are uninsured, that are undocumented, you're not going to find that nexus and benefit. So when we're talking about expansion, let's keep in mind that the legislation did not cover every person that is uh, a resident here of this state. You know, I, I find this interesting also. The city of Houston, I don't know if you're aware of this, but in order to have a contract at the city, the contractor has to have insurance for their employees or they pay a fine. So it, it'll be interesting to see if other cities do the same thing. Uh, I don't know what Obamacare is going to do as far as the cities getting involved in this. Uh, maybe, maybe setting up some policies that cities have to enforce it. Uh, but it'll be interesting to see what happens to the, those contractors. Hmm. You know, I think what we're really boiling down to is it's going to help the community one way or the other, but how are we going to pay for it? Or maybe mm -hmm. the shift in operations, because we're already paying it through, through the hospital care. Maybe that extra cost is going to be saved and is going to cover the new cost of, of preventative health care. Is that what we're looking at? Well, that's what, that's what happened with the dialysis clinic. We saved the, uh, we saved the health. When we, when we got the, health, the hospital district to set up the Riverside Dialysis Clinic, um, we started saving them uh, about a million dollars a year. Four million, excuse me, four million dollars a year. I was corrected. So four million dollars a, a year just by setting up that, that, that dialysis clinic. Uh, so people didn't go to the emergency room to get dialysis care, and they got it on a regular basis, and it was it was effective to keeping them healthy. Hmm. Ultimately, who muddies the water is the special interest and the lobbyist and every everyone else that plays effect on the cost of uh, of doing business. 
and everything else. Well, you know, with that note, what do we do to support it or kill it? You're looking at the me. silence. <laughs> well, you know, Beto uh, is the guru when it comes to immigration policies. Yes, he is. So when you when you put the two policies together, the Obamacare and the immigration policies, how is that going to work together? Uh, are we going to have an, an issue with uh, immigrants also getting the required in, insurance? Well, right now, uh, the way the law was passed and the way it stands, if you are an undocumented immigrant, you don't count. Um, you are not even counted as a person for formula purposes with state Medicaid funding. You're not counted at all. So um, I think that's a blemish, quite frankly, on the Ob Obama administration and on the Democrats in Congress for not wanting to count undocumented immigrants. So this. What about all and those students that are part of the DREAM Act, if you will, uh, that have been here all their lives? Yeah. And they've been here since birth. You know, what are we going to do with those folks? Well, I'd like to see what ends up happening because, quite frankly, we haven't seen the rules uh, that the Obama administration has proposed. We've only seen the qualifications. So we need to see how this is going to be enacted, and it's really just temporary. Okay. We have a caller on the line. We had a caller on the line. She's gone. Anne-Marie, call back if you want to. We've got two minutes left on the air. Um, very interesting to hear that, you know, for those that don't know, under the ACA Affordable Care Act, we do not count undocumented immigrants. Correct. And they do not and will not qualify for any care. Is that correct? That's right. Well, they've, 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 and they, they've never qualified for Medicaid. Now people, you know, will, will, one of the arguments that people will make was, well, they're coming here just to get, you know, free, free services. Well, that's false. They don't get free services. They don't get Medicaid. That's right. They don't get, they don't get Social Security. They don't get food <clears> stamps. Food yeah. stamps. They don't get any of that stuff. But they do pay into the system for under all the taxes that have been paid, maybe the... the the Social Security that wasn't collected back? If, if, they, if they gave a, 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 a number that they may have had or may have bought, uh, they, that will be paid in. But, they, but even, if they're, even if they're not working, they're paying, they're paying sales tax. The, the, if they don't own uh, their property that they live in, the property owner pays property tax. Uh, so they are paying, uh, and, and studies have been done that shows that it's basically a break even for the, for the state. You know, what, what, what the state ends up spending, maybe for indigent care and things like that, the, it's it's made up with the taxes that that they pay in through sales tax and through property tax. Mm. Closing remarks. I think we have to wait and see uh, what's going to happen, particularly on that health care issue. And it's the same thing on immigration. Um, the DREAM Act was not implemented. This is actually even worse than a watered-down version uh, because it doesn't really give you a final answer. It's a deferred action on your deportation or your removal uh, from this country. And so I, I have my reservations. I think it's a good step in the absence of nothing, but it remains to be seen what will happen. Was it just a political move? I think it was a very smart political move, but as I, uh, I did say, it was a little bit more foam and less beer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good closing comments. Father? Well, I think there's, there's no such thing as just a political move. I think there, you know, it, was, it was a political move. Uh, it was very, I, I think I agree with, with Beth, it was a very shrewd political move. Um, and, uh, you know, it's not like nobody's done a political move before in their life. So, I mean, both sides have been doing political moves. Some people could say that, it's been, that the, the, the other side's opposition to this, to the ACA and other things, is, is political also. Mm. You know, so. And again, in the absence of nothing, it's better than anything you know, that was on the table. Right. Good to know. Gentlemen? You know, Marvin Ziller said it best, right? It's hell to be poor. It is hell to be poor. Mm -hmm. Well, and on that note, uh, hopefully you enjoyed the show. Uh, you are watching Latino Talk TV. Tonight we covered a very... Uh, wonderful organization called the TMO. Uh, once again, the Metropolitan Organization. Don't forget, we have La Mafia next week. Two weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks from now. Two weeks from now, we're going to bring in some live musicians uh, that have done some tremendous work here in the Houston community. We're going to hear their stories. So with that, you're watching Latino Talk TV. Have a great night.